I'm going to begin by doing a reading from the language of letting go, which is the daily meditation book for codependency. And I picked the reading from January the 25th, because basically it kind of fits into our topic for tonight. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. There are many different versions of the first step for recovering codependence. Some of us admit powerlessness over alcohol or another's alcoholism. Some of us admit powerlessness over people. Some over the impact of growing up in an alcoholic family. One of the most significant words in the first step is the word we. We come together because of a common problem. And in the coming together, we find a common solution. Through the fellowship of 12-step programs, many of us discover that although we may have felt alone in our pain, others have experienced a similar suffering, and now many are joining hands in a similar way. We, a significant yet part of recovery, a shared experience, a shared strength, stronger for the sharing, a shared hope for better lives and relationships. Today, I will be grateful for the many people across the world who now call themselves recovering codependents. Help me know that each time one of us takes a step forward, we will pull the entire group along with us. I want to do that reading because I really wanted to concentrate. What we're doing right now, we're going to do a series on the 12 steps, but to concentrate primarily or applying the steps to codependency, but they can be applied to any area of life when you come right down to it. Step one, to me, is one of the most important steps in the program. It's a foundation step. See, I often said that the first three steps of the program, to me anyway, are what I call the foundations of recovery. They kind of set the footwork and the groundwork for recovery. I want to kind of begin talking about step one in a very simple way. And to me, the most important word in the step is the word we. I emphasize that because I've learned something in the course of my own journey, and especially dealing with codependency, that so many of us try to do it alone. I know in recovery a lot of times, even as addicts, we try to do it alone. But really in reality, we can't do anything alone. I finally got that through my thick Italian head. I realize over and over again that the importance is that we need each other, we need to be connected to each other, and all recovery takes place in a family system. All recovery takes place in support for one another. And that's why this process actually works. So we talk about the first step. I want to kind of break it up into five different categories and show you how the first step works. Because the first step talks about admitting that we are powerless. And basically that powerlessness can be in a lot of different directions. It can be over a substance. It can be over a person. It can be over a job. I can be powerless over very many things in life. The key is, does it make my life unmanageable? And that's the key to the whole thing. We'll come right down to it. And so tonight what I want to talk about is what I call the five words of the first step. And I'll put them in order and then I'll break them up for you. The first word I want to talk about is the word unmanageability. Under it, I put the word denial. The third word is called powerlessness. The fourth is admit. And the last one is accept. Now, all five of those words are key to the first step of the program. Because really, in reality, I want you to look at that diagram. But look at it from the word in the middle, which is the word powerlessness. I am convinced that God, the higher power, gives us Two gifts in life, the gift of powerlessness and the gift of pain. You might say, thanks a lot. But really, in reality, think about it for a minute. You go to a gym, they have a big sign that says, no pain, no gain. Wherever you go, you hear that. And in recovery, it's no different. Because one of the hardest things for us to be able to do is be able to experience the gift of powerlessness. There are so many things in life we're powerless over, not just the substance. We're also powerless over aging. We're powerless over relationships. We're powerless over so many things in the course of our journey. And to me, 
The key to growth in life is being able to accept the gift of powerlessness. It's all part of the process that we go through in life, and that's important. And so what I want to talk about tonight is I have a choice. We all have choices. I can deny my powerlessness, and that will create unmanageability in my life. Or I can admit to it, and then eventually I'll come to acceptance. Now, I really want to talk about the word acceptance just for a couple of minutes. I consider acceptance the most spiritual word in the big book, the most spiritual word in recovery. And I say that because when you come to acceptance, you come to peace. But nobody just comes to acceptance. Sorry about that. We have to, almost like we have this disease. I call it in Italian, I call it the Capitosa disease, which means we're brickheads. We got to do it the hard way first. We got to fight, we got to battle, and finally, you come around. But you know, I've learned over and over again. Now I'm no different than you or anybody else. We constantly, constantly do it the hard way. We battle and we struggle. Because I don't want to have to look at the things I have to look at. Do I want to change or do I want to grow? And recovery is not easy. And by the way, it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be a growing process. And so what I've learned in life is that the gift of powerlessness helps me to realize what life really is all about. But watch what happens. All of us do this. I love it. We experience powerlessness. At first, we try to deny it. And denial is part of grieving. Why? Do I really want to change? I'm scared. It's natural to be scared. Think about it from the perspective. So many of us are used to a certain lifestyle, even codependence. We have roles that we play. We play them for years. And then all of a sudden, i got to face the reality of it and go through a change process. And change is scary. It's not easy. It means I have to begin to learn a whole new concept, a whole new way of life. It's called the change process of life. I joke with addicts when I work with them in a rehab. I always kind of get a kick out of it. I tell them there are two curse words that addicts can't stand. I love the curse. I can't help it. The two curse words are, Reality and responsibility. In short, the hardest thing in life that we have to do is to live in reality. I don't know about you, but for a good period of my life, even when I was in the priesthood, I literally basically lived in denial. I lived in a secret world. And literally for a long period of time, I ran away from the things I had to do. I used to isolate. I used to hide. And by the way, it was a great place to hide. And as a result, then I learned in my codependency stuff, I can fix everybody else. But I never wanted to look at me. See, I could tell everybody else they were powerless. I could show them their powerlessness. I could actually point it out to them. But did I look at my own and look at my own mirror? No. Why? I was scared. I was scared to look at the real me on the inside. And so many of us are scared of that because... Eventually, we have to come to what I call admitting. But we got to run the gauntlet first. I love it. Now, some of us call that relapse. Some of us call it a lot of different names. But it's almost like I'm powerless. I deny. I get unmanageable. Then I admit. And I have some more powerlessness, some more denial, some more unmanageability, some more admitting. So I get sick and tired and being sick and tired until I wear out. Aren't we amazing? Now, I share this with codependents especially. Codependence, I even hate doing the first step with codependence because they get upset at me. I'll tell you why they get upset. Codependents like to start with the fourth step, not the first. The reason for that is they want to do somebody else's inventory. See, we're good at this. What can I tell you? So I've learned over the years, the hardest thing for me to do is to experience my powerlessness. And there's so many things in life you have no power over. You can't control them. Here's the big piece when it comes to codependency. So many of us have a tendency to want to try to control life, to control situations. You can't do that. Control is a scary word. Letting go of control is even scarier. And so the concept is to truly grow. We have to come to the point of our life where we finally begin to admit. But here's what I want to share with you tonight. 
So I'll share on a personal level. Admitting is only one form of recovery. To admit to something does not mean that you accept it. I always talk about two things, which I love talking about. It's one is called intellectual recovery, and one is called gut recovery. Intellectual recovery is how we normally begin the process. Intellectual recovery means that up here in this thing, the control tower, I call it, the nutty tower, this place up here, I mean, many of us would call it the con tower. It's totally amazing. I have a tendency, I can admit. It means intellectually, I can say things like, yes, I'm an addict. Yes, I'm a codependent. Yes, I'm this. And yes, I'm that. And everything else. And we admit it. But we don't accept it. It's called intellectual recovery. And codependents were great at this. Want to know why? Because we love to read books. We love to watch presentations. We love to get information. And we love to analyze. I've learned over the years one of the scariest things in the whole recovery process is analyzation. We think too much, we analyze too much, and we're always trying to figure it out. That goes for all areas, even for addicts. So many addicts try to figure out why they're an addict. I love that one. Why am I an addict? Of course, you're an addict. See how simple it is? It's not complicated. But see, i got to figure it out. Maybe I'm an addict because somebody gave it to me, or I got a gene, or this or that, or anything else, or down the line. Have fun. Codependence the exact same way. Why am I a codependent? What is codependency? Why am I involved in different types of things to make my life unmanageable? Maybe it's because I'm actually comfortable with unmanageability. It becomes normal after a while. And so what's important is to be able not just to admit. So I'll give you a formula to kind of show you what I mean. We first come into any part of the growth process in life. We come in through the intellect. We come in through our head. And we're able to get the information. We're able to find out about it. We can even analyze the whole situation. Now, it's fun being in a rehab because everybody raises their hand and says, Hi, I'm an addict. Okay? Because if they don't, somebody's going to scream at them. Yeah. Put that hand up. All right. All right. <laughs> but see, that's the intellectual part. If you hang around long enough, and the intellectual part always works. It takes time. Now, let me take this back to codependency for a couple of minutes. Codependents like the in, like intellectual recovery. Want to know why? Because we're in charge. Isn't it fun to be in charge? It means that I got the answers. I got the books. I got the information. And I'm going to actually figure myself out. Codependents are what I refer to as self-therapists. I love them. We don't need a therapist. We're our own therapist. And as a result, then, we can analyze everything and figure it out because we're stuck up here. But if you hang around long enough, you get tired of being up there, and eventually, it'll start, gravity will take over. It'll move down. You'll start to see things, and you'll start to hear things. Now, this is the most important piece. I've learned this over and over and over again. The greatest teachers on the face of this earth are other human beings. Are other human beings. You know, I went to school for my degree. And guess what? I passed all the courses. Not by much, but I passed anyway. But the bottom line is, I learned nothing about life and nothing about anything until I began the journey of experience. And there's nothing like a teacher of experience. I've said this over and over again. Every one of us in this room is the most important person on the face of this earth. Each one of us is a book in process of being written. Your story, no matter what your story is, is the greatest story on the face of this earth. Your story has its ups and it has its downs. It has its, its pitfalls and it has its joy. It's a mixture of a lot of things. But it's your story. Now, when we come together, I refer to it as the human library. When we come together and share our experiences and our strengths with one another, we learn from each person that we meet. We learn from every experience that we go through. 
I tell people a lot of times when I'm doing counselor training, when somebody comes in, they're not your patient, they're not your client, they're your teacher. Look at everybody you meet in life as a teacher, because they've come into your life to teach you something about yourself. Every individual relationship that we're involved in, no matter what it is, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a girlfriend, boyfriend, 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 whatever it happens to be, every person that comes into your life that becomes part of your journey is also a teacher in your life. Your parents, your family, the things you went through in the course of your journey, they're all teachers. And the bottom line is, can I come to a point in my growth process where I'm able to process this stuff to experience and to learn from other people around me. But the biggest mistake I make and many of us make is I try to do it by myself. I've learned over and over again, you can't do it by yourself. You need support. You know, one of the hardest things for codependents is to get them to get that support because so many of us want to do it our way. But I've learned over and over again, I need to be around people I can identify with. Some lady was in to see me today, and I really enjoyed talking to her. And what I realized so powerfully as I talked to her, I was talking to my sister. Do I have a sister? No. But today, I met somebody that could be my sister. And I asked her at the end of our session, I said, did you live in my house? She scared me because I could relate to everything she was saying. She taught me a lot about myself. Of course, I was eerie when I was talking to her. I was actually seeing me. It's amazing sometimes when you experience other individuals and people, you see a little piece of yourself, you learn something more about yourself. Because I really believe that God speaks to us through people, God speaks to us through circumstances, and God speaks to us through different situations in life. And that's where we learn our lessons from. Now, what happens a lot of times is, Eventually, we get to a point with that gravity, we begin to talk, we begin to share, we get connected. The danger part about the recovery process and it's part of the grieving process, because if we know the stages of grieving, so many of us get into what I call the bargaining stage, or the stage where I'm going to try to take control over again. It's a fight, it's a battle, I know it, but I love that first step. Because that first step lays one of those solid foundations for growth, for recovery, and for life. But again, not like anybody else, it takes time. There's no simple concept to this. Nobody just gets the first step. You know, you're not walking down the street and you come past the door and say, maybe I'll stop in and get the first step. It doesn't work that way. It's a process we have to go through. And I'm grateful today to these steps in general. I'm grateful for the first step because I know it came in pain and it came with struggle. It didn't come in a simple way. I don't want it to come in a simple way. And that's why it's important to realize the fact that look within your own self and ask yourself some very simple questions as you go through the journey. Do you try to control everything? Do you think that actually you have the power to be able to handle everything in life? Do you try to the best of your ability to try to figure everything out? I don't know about you. Maybe it's when I'm getting old, I don't know. I don't figure things out anymore. I just let them roll, see what happens. You know, I'm also understanding more and more that life is just a journey. And whatever happens, whoever you meet, whatever you experience is what you're supposed to experience. The teachers come into your life, they leave your life. They come for short periods of time. They come for long periods of time. And that's why I always go back to the big book of AA and my favorite part of the big book, which is the doctor's opinion. And I love that part of the big book because I look back and look at the simple, simple things that chapter has in the big book. It talks about the concept of living life one day at a time, of realizing the fact that you need one another. Dr. Bob and Bill W. tried to teach that to us way back in the beginning because the two of them never would have got sober if they didn't do it together. The most important thing that ever happened in our recovery process was the two of them said, 
Let's try to help one another just for one day not to pick up. And the second day, they had it one day. And then one day. And then one day. And I love that one day concept. It's so simple and it's so beautiful and it works. As codependents, we have to learn the exact same thing. I don't want to spend the rest of my life trying to figure life out. Why? I want to live life and be part of it. But realize the fact there's many things that have occurred in the course of our life that we're powerless over. You know, we're powerless over all the things around us. We're powerless over the weather. We're powerless over aging. Take all the aging creams you want to take. You're still going to age. Congratulations. Isn't it wonderful? I get a kick out of that one. You know, I'm not going to get old. Yes, you are. You want to go through the same stages of life everybody goes through. A meditation book this morning was beautiful. The Native American Indian elders, I, I, I read that every morning. And today they talked about the journey of life. It was really powerful. They said everybody goes through the stage of being born, the stages of growth, and the stages of dying. It's all part of the journey. And I, whatever you do on that journey is entirely up to you. You have to look back on it and realize the fact that God has taken all of us on a journey. There's a beginning and there's an ending. And I believe after that, there's another beginning and another ending. It's a process we have to go through. We used to kind of have fun a lot of times when somebody in recovery died. We'd all autograph a big book and put it in their casket. Just in case they needed it when they got to the other side. We used to have a lot of fun doing stuff like that. Because I realized over and over again, I don't know about you, but I have so much gratitude today for this first step in the program. I have gratitude for all the people that have been part of my journey and part of my life. I have so much gratitude for those that will still be part of my journey and part of my life. And I realize over and over again, I don't want to walk the journey of life all by myself. I need to be connected to a family. And family is where the process takes place. You know, we all need help. The hardest words we, words we have ever have to say in the course of our journey are the words, help me, help me. And I'm going to tell you a secret. If you're able to utter those two special words, you will get the help. You may not know where it's coming from, but you will get it. And I love that simplicity and that beauty. I always love telling a story, and I like stories, so I might as well tell you one. I love the story, and it's one of my favorite stories, of a saint in the Catholic Church named St. Augustine, or St. Augustine. And I love his story. This gentleman, if you look at his life and the, concept, the concepts of his life, there's a book called The Confessions of St. Augustine. His life in our categories of today, he would be a womanizer, a sex addict, probably a drug addict and an alcoholic, he was a man that sowed his oats. He was a man that was crazy. He was totally insane. He had some really crazy things. And he beat the crap out of himself and put himself in all kinds of jeopardy. Until one day he got to a point where he could not take it anymore. He came to a point of despair. And he finally got to that point. He had a nickname for this, they call it in recovery circles, the dark night of the soul. There actually is something we studied in theology back in the 15th century called the dark night of the soul. Now I understand it better now. But literally, it's almost like he went into a pit of despair to a point he was on the verge of killing himself. He got to a point where he was totally empty, totally powerless. He couldn't do anything anymore. And he was going to end it. And the, the story goes, he fell down on his knees he screamed, he yelled, and he said, please help me. I can't do this anymore. And he said the words, I surrender. And the story goes on to tell that somehow, some way, a hand reached down, grabbed him, and pulled him up, and started him on his journey. And he tells a story that he has no idea where the hand came from. But something grabbed him, yanked him up, and got him started. And literally because he asked for help, he got help. And he's a good example of the first step of the program. 
because he went into a state of despair. He finally had to come to a state of surrender. And all of us know what this is about. You come to a state of surrender. You come to a place where you actually have to say to others, I need help. Help me. I cannot do it by myself. That is the most powerful statement on the face of this earth. And when you come to that point, all of a sudden, help will arrive. It is totally amazing when you come down to it. The bottom line is very simple. I'm no different than you. We all have that disease. I said it earlier. We all got to kind of beat ourselves up a little bit, be hard on ourselves, drive ourselves half crazy, make ourselves half nuts. And then finally, we come to that point. Is it painful? Yes. And it's okay. I call it healthy pain. You come, we call it the bottom. I come to the point where finally I'm going to move forward. And I love that concept because I believe very deeply, deep down inside, that all of us go through what I call the dark night of the soul. We go through the empty hole that we have inside of us. We have to go through the change and finally realize the fact that there's got to be a better way. I got to move through a better way. But the most beautiful part about it is to reach out, ask for help, reach this out to somebody else, and above all, don't try to figure it out or do it yourself. Isn't it great to be human? Be fantastic. So I use that analogy of the body. We have to fight and battle and struggle until eventually things get down to the gut. We get in touch with feelings. And down in the gut, what do we do? We process it. The stuff we keep that's good and healthy goes down to our feet. Then we walk it and we live it. Stuff that's not so healthy goes out the rear. Takes care of that. No problem at all. I love that concept. It's called processing the crap. And I always say this because my favorite word, and I consider it a spiritual word, is the word fertilizer. I love the word fertilizer. Because from our crap, if you process it, and the steps are nothing but a processing machine, it'll become fertilizer for recovery. Isn't that fantastic? So please, try to look at life in a very positive way. Remember, all the experiences you've gone through, no matter what they are, and you might even think sometimes you're the worst person on the face of this earth. You might think that you screwed up. You might think of this and you might think of that. And it's okay, because we all do it. Remember, every experience you've gone through can one day become your strength and one day become your hope. That's why I try to tell people, don't try to get rid of your history. Don't try to eliminate it. Be open to it. Because your history is your most powerful teacher. We learn from everything around us. I'll give you an example of this. I spent a lot of years being angry at everybody and at everything. Angry at institutions, angry at the church, angry at my mother, angry at my father, angry at my family, angry at this, angry at that, angry at everything. Because, you know, I played a game for a long period of time. We love playing this game, by the way. It's called the blame game. God, it's wonderful. See, as long as I can blame somebody else for what's going on in my life, I never have to look at me. That's a lot of fun, by the way. And for codependence, as long as I can work on somebody else, I never have to look at me. You see, we basically, it's amazing. Remember a lady went to an ACOA meeting, and she came in and told me afterwards, she said, I went to that meeting. Those people were pretty sick at that meeting. I said, why'd you send me there? I said, maybe it's because maybe you belong there? Oh, well, I saw some people there. They need my help. I said, no, they don't. <laughs> You need their help. See how we operate? You know, because when they first, when this particular lady went there the first time, she was doing everybody else's inventory. She had all the answers to everything for everybody. It took her a long time to finally get her through a thick head, but she finally realized the fact, wait a minute. Why am I here? Why am I connecting? Why am I doing this? Got to look at me. Now, I'm going to tell you. It is a lot of fun to look at everybody else's stuff. It really is. I did it for a lot of years. I used to hide in the priesthood. It's a great place to hide. 
because I could work on everybody else and never have to look at me or work on me. And I'm learning today over and over again <clears throat> the value of me, the value of myself as a person. So I go back to that first step because we're laying a foundation now, which are the foundations for recovery. The first step is the step of surrender, the step of admitting, but above all, the step of acceptance. I have to come to an acceptance of my personal self. Try to realize this. Each one of us is exactly who we are supposed to be. We're not an accident and we're not a mistake. We're exactly where we are supposed to be on our journey at this moment in life. And whatever we're experiencing, even the hurt, the pain, the losses, the things we go through, and people move forward in another direction, we still are still experiencing exactly who we are supposed to be. We're on a journey. And so I have a choice. I can beat myself up, look at myself negatively. I can keep, have a wonderful, fantastic self-pity trip. I've done a lot of fun sometimes, by the way. You know, poor me. Why am I like this? Why is everybody like that? Why? Take a break, will you? Give yourself a break. Look within your own self. And what I've learned over and over again as a result of the first step, I go back to that one simple little word. Please don't forget it. The word is we. Notice in the first step, it doesn't say, I admitted. It says, we admitted. And that means I need people to help me in this process, to do it together, because we're family. <coughs> and I realize over and over again, the gift of family, which is so important. And so every one of us in this place, excuse me for one second there, is drying up. That's on tape. Good. It brings the human element into it. <coughs> I've learned over and over again the fact that when you try to do things by yourself, and I really want to speak to codependence for a couple of minutes, when you try to figure everything out, do everything by yourself, you're so, it's so lonely. It's unbelievable. I don't want to spend the rest of my life being alone. I don't want to have to just spend the rest of my life being intellectual. I don't want to spend the rest of my life just trying to figure everything out. I want to be part of a family. I want to be connected. Did I come from a dysfunctional family? Well, my family won awards. They're amazing. Unbelievable. You know, most Italian families are good at this anyway, so it's not a problem. But I look back on them today, and boy, <coughs> I have so much gratitude. I really do. Was I angry at my mom? Yes, I was. She was an addict. She had her stuff. But I realized something today. She was also a great teacher and gave me a lot of strengths, a lot of things in life. Look at my dad. <clears throat> my dad was probably what would have won the Kobe Pendency of the Year Award. Totally amazing. Mr. Wonderful, Mr. Fantastic, who did everything for everybody. The only problem was the man never did a thing for himself his whole entire life. He had no life. He got all of his love, all of his affection from doing stuff from people. And God, did he train me well. It's amazing sometimes. How many times I burnt myself out and drove myself into the ground? Because <clears throat> I was always, always giving, 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 and giving. We have to learn how to receive. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, the secret to a good, healthy life <clears throat> is learning the secret of being able to say, I need help. I call them the most spiritual words on the face of this earth. The second most spiritual words are to come to an acceptance of myself as a person. And the third most powerful spiritual concept is, is to realize the fact I never have to be alone again. Because I have brothers and sisters I am connected to. We're part of one another. And what's so beautiful about that is, we're all equal. We're all connected together. And no one's any better than anybody else. We're just people walking a journey, learning and growing and discovering things inside of ourselves. What's so beautiful about surrendering and coming to acceptance is we get ready then for the second and the third step. Two most beautiful steps in the program. Come to believe 
I came to believe in a power greater than myself. There's something out there guiding me. We're not in charge. Now, this is really almost blasphemous for codependence. Because we love being in charge. But the concept is we're not. And I've learned over and over again over the course of the journey of life that if you truly get out of the way, that second and third step, and all of a sudden, everything kind of comes where it's supposed to come. I call these the miracles. But they happen in God's time, not in our time. They happen through faith. They happen through belief. Let me tell you a miracle story. I love miracles. And, you know, it's funny how things work in this world. And basically, over a period of time, we see the miracles. And I could probably stay till midnight tonight and tell you miracle stories. But I have to tell you a story of a lady named, it's not a real name, by the way. I don't use real names when I use names. But I, I just call her Diane. I, I call it Diane's story. And I love telling her story. But it is a true story, and it's but not by that name. Diane and her mother, her mother was an alcoholic, and Diane was a drug addict. And the two of them lived together in a house. And the two of them were like oil and water. They beat the living crap out of each other. When she turned 18, her mother threw her out of the house, told her she was a bum, she would never amount to anything, that she was no good, that she was rotten. She's nothing but a damn junkie. Diane lived on the streets of Camden for four years. She prostituted herself, did all kinds of crazy stuff in order to get drugs to survive on the streets. After four years of living on the streets at age 22, they found her under the Ben Franklin Bridge. Two cops found her. She had overdosed. They were able to bring her back. They brought her to Cooper Hospital and basically revived her. And from there, they transferred her to Northwestern Institute in Fort Washington, the psychiatric unit. And she spent 60 days in the psych unit. And we spent a lot. She really was there for a long period of time to get stabilized. After 60 days in the psych unit, they transferred her to the drug and alcohol unit at Northwestern. And that's where I met her. Because I used to go up there back in 1992 and give talks and be connected with the people at the recovery program. Diane and I, for some reason, got to have a lot of conversation. We talked a lot together. She was run from the South Jersey area. And so when she left there, she came back here because we had IOP here then. And she went through the IOP program here and did really well. We became very good friends. But Diane would say something to me, which I'll never forget. She would say to me all the time, Vince, I really wish I knew where my mom was. You know, I feel really bad about what happened between me and my mom. You know, I, I know that we had a lot of bad feelings with one another. And I know the things that have happened. But I know what the work I've done and the work you've helped me to do. I've been able to do a lot of healing inside of myself. I wish I could heal with my mom. I told Diane something I tell a lot of people. And to me, it's something you will have to learn. I said, Diane, I said, pray for your mom every day. Wish her well and give her to God. You're powerless. You have no control over your mom. The only thing you can do is work on you. But she kept insisting and talking to me all the time about her mom, about her mom, about her mom. And she just basically just wished and wished and wished. And I kept telling her the same thing over and over again. When she was 29 years old, she was engaged to be married. I was going to perform her wedding. And normally when I do weddings for people in the program, I usually bring them in for five or six sessions. We call it premarital preparation. And we're going through that and we're talking a lot. And she said to me, you know, Vince, I wish my mom could come to my wedding. And I said the same thing to her I said over and over again. Pray for your mom. Wish her well. You never know where God has in store for you in the journey. Well, the miracle of this story was her company, she had a good job. She was doing good. Her company sent her on a trip. She was changing planes in Los Angeles. She was sitting in the airport waiting for a flight back to New Jersey. A lady was sitting there who looked very familiar. It was her mom. Her mom had been in AA for two years 
and was wondering where she was. God brought them together in an airport in Los Angeles. Mom got to come to her wedding. They made amends. They worked things out together. And it's amazing. It took a lot of time. You know, it took seven years before they finally had the reunion. But you never know. See, I've learned something in this program. There's so many things in life that we're powerless over. So many things we have no control over. But if we get into that second and third step, which we'll do next week, we have to learn to give things to where they belong, to give them to God. And if things are supposed to be, they'll be, as long as we're able to let it go. And that is the hardest part of everything in life. That's why I love that third step when we talk about let go and let God. And the hardest thing is, every time I try to control another person, try to control a relationship, even try to control children, guess what? It doesn't work. You try to control, you push away. And people run away. And that's why it's so important in the course of our journey to look within our own self and see the beauty of ourself as a person. And I really believe that everybody in this room is a walking miracle. The miracles are right inside of us. We have to come to believe. Because you have to realize the fact that we've got to go through powerlessness. We have to realize the fact that we're not in charge. Isn't it wonderful? So nice to just have to do your work and let things flow where they're going to flow. But I'm telling you, if you get out of the way, everything usually goes where it's supposed to go. So I'm going to follow up this first step on powerlessness and surrender and talk a lot next week about the gift of the higher power, the gift of the second and third step. I see these first three steps as the foundations for everything that we do in life. They're the basics. They're getting us ready for the journey of life because every day in my life, I experience powerlessness. Every day. There are things I end up being powerless over. This is totally amazing. You come right down to it. And there's things you just, you just have to realize that and accept it. And some of us have to understand this process of the first step and also to be able to connect it, not just to addiction, but to connect to a lot of different areas in life. And realize the fact that it is what I call the ultimate process of life. Surrendering. And then leads into letting go. A big part of it. So thanks for coming out.